us your time. Um, you know, quite often when I do Bible studies or I have the opportunity to teach, I feel like God gives me something pretty immediately. And uh, I don't know about you if you have direct deposit, but sometimes Thursday night it will show on your bank account, but you can't use it till Friday, and there's that little time where it's pending. Um, I feel like that's happening in my heart right now. There's a pending. I feel like this is kind of unfolding. So this is fresh in, in my life with the Lord's teaching me. It's not fully come, come to fruition, but um, may the Holy Spirit cause that to happen in my heart and yours tonight. Um, but once again, my name is James. I have some pictures. I love to teach through pictures. I'm very visual, um, and I also talk with my hands. So, but uh, I want to actually read a scripture before I show a picture. It's this. It's First Corinthians 16:9. If you could just close your eyes with me, I'm visual. If you're going to fall asleep, keep your eyes open. But if you want to close your eyes to picture, I'm going to read a scripture. First Corinthians 16:9 says, "For a wide door for effective ministry has opened to me, and at that door, at that door." There are many adversaries. For a wide door for effective ministry has opened to me. And there are, at that door there are many adversaries. This is a scripture that's... You can open your eyes, thank you. This is a scripture that's near to my heart because uh, the Lord has given me and created and opened a door for many moments to experience Him and help others experience Him. Uh, but at that door stands uh, an adversary. And I want to talk tonight about what that adversary looks like in my life and may look like in your life and what the Bible says the voice of that adversary sounds like. And then I also want to share with us what God says to that voice, what God says to that adversary, and, uh, and what instruction for everyday living or practical living does God give us to overcome that adversary. But can I show you some pictures? Can we do that? Okay. Can we, uh, my name is James, and I have a beautiful wife. Her name is Casey. Let's, Oh yeah, I promise she's more beautiful than that. She's she's coming, and we're rolling with a technical difficulty, right? Uh, she's also in the front row. I could have her turn away. I'll give it five more seconds. Oh yeah, that's my wife Casey, and then our joy. It's uh, something. <laughs> That still makes me cry when I see him. He is such a blessing in my life. And that's my son Luke, he's a year and a half. And uh, we have another one on the way. Uh, that child, yeah! That child is five months old. We'll find out soon if it's a boy or a girl. I'm not really sure. Um, but I'm excited that, that we're gonna have another child. But I am a father. <laughs> and uh, uh, to me, that is a very potent thing. Um, and the Lord is a good father. He's my father. Um, but a particular vehicle that I got in that took me to become a father was the vehicle of mercy. And mercy is defined by Webster as withholding what is due. We sung about grace tonight. Grace is receiving what is undeserved. And that's salvation, right? Uh, but mercy is withholding what is due. And I made some knucklehead mistakes in my life, I tell you. Um, it's interesting. Tuesday I turned 30 years old. It's kind of surreal. I, I know I'm still young, but it's sobering because I came here when I was 21, about to turn 22. And uh, I was just a young boy, um, immature and foolish and arrogant. And I know those things still happen in my heart, but now I'm a, I'm a man. And I have a wife and two kids. And it's so interesting um, how the last nine years have unfolded in my life. But I've made knucklehead decisions over my life. I've made poor choices and I've made foolish decisions. Um, but the Lord has not given me what I deserved based on those decisions. He's given me mercy. The Lord has given me mercy. Tonight I want to talk about mercy uh, versus the voice of the accuser. And I want to look at a story, and I'm not a theologian by any means, so I'm not about to unpack this text, but what I want to look at is some points that I see that the Bible teaches us. And uh, in this story, you see an accuser. And uh, I have some pictures that illustrate the accusing one, right? The, point, the pointing finger. And so what I would just say as we scroll through these specific uh, uh, pictures, see which one sticks in your heart, which one stands out to you. Because I believe based on that, the Lord's going to reveal something. But can we go to the next one? Guilt. Guilt is something that is a, a result of an accusing voice. It's worth a thousand words, right? Can we go to the next one? Silence. 
I don't know if any of you have feel silenced. I feel like a good, good title to the li my life is the Lord removing a muzzle and giving me a microphone, literally. Maybe you feel like you're hanging on by a thread. But the accusing voice, his main goal is to do this, is to disconnect you from God. Which sin in our life does that? Like, I'm a sinful man. I think things I shouldn't. I say things I shouldn't. As early as two hours ago, I probably could have said something a lot more kinder to my wife. Um, we, as human beings, the Bible says, are broken. Are, we're sinful before God. Um, but can we put that image back up, the one that's the man distant from God? But that chasm right there, that gap, is bridged through Jesus. And I feel like I want to speak to a group that maybe does not know Jesus tonight, um, maybe has heard of him, but the Bible says that he calls after us. He, he woos us like a love, like a lover. He draws us to himself. He wants to get to know us. But Jesus, and then there's a group that may know Jesus, but may have that accusing voice that just heckles us constantly, that speaks things to us, that makes us feel like we're in a prison cell. Maybe we feel guilty. Maybe we feel shameful for past mistakes. I'm not sure what's happening in your heart, but the Holy Spirit is. And the purpose of the enemy is to accuse us. The Bible teaches us that he's the accuser of our soul. Uh, that Webster defines accuse as to speak against. To speak against. So the Bible teaches us that the enemy is constantly speaking against us. Constantly speaking against us. Uh, we get a good picture of this in uh, the story of the adulterous woman. And what I would like to do is look at that. So if you have your Bible, it's going to be on the screen behind me. But if you have your Bible, please turn to John chapter 8, starting in verse 1. So John chapter 8, starting in verse 1. I'm just going to read behind me. Here we go. Okay, first one. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him. And he sat down and began to teach them. I just want to get a time out because I felt this in my heart. I feel like very similar to that, we have all gathered here tonight. We have all come together to hear Jesus, to speak to Jesus. I'm not Jesus, but we are longing to hear the voice of God. And right now, if there's already things trying to pull your attention, take you to another place, whether it's in your heart or in your mind, I feel like here's the time that we get to listen to Jesus, yeah? We get to listen to Jesus. Let's go on. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. And having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law of Moses, and now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What then do you say? They were saying this, testing him, so they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard that, when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone. And the woman, where she was, in the center of the court, straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on and sin no more. Go now and sin no more. Okay, there's a lot in this. It's very peculiar to me off the bat that this woman was caught literally in the act of adultery and they bring him before Jesus they bring her before Jesus to be put to death to stone, which is part of the Mosaic law. But where's the man? Because the man under the Mosaic Law says should be there as well. And I only, some of you may be thinking, what does this have to do with my life? Well, I share this for this sake. That these people were bringing, according to the scripture, to accuse and trap Jesus. And they were already starting to, the, the sentence against this woman was unjust. And it started with the truth, and then it went off to the right field. And you see that in the story of the temptation with Jesus, that quite often the enemy presents something as a half-truth, and then it gets twisted. Half-truth and gets twisted. And what, they were pre what the enemy was presenting to me is that I am uh, a... Okay, so one thing that I'm just vulnerable with in my life is anger. Um, 
like sometimes I skip it and go straight to rage. That's where my heart wants to go to. It's like, it's in interesting. And the Bible says a lot about anger, anger. You can be angry and do not sin. When I was 16 years old, my grandma, I love my Nana so much, someone robbed her and took her purse. And, you know, I was 16. I grabbed a bat and I went looking in the streets to try to find this guy as though he's going to be holding the sign saying, this is my, your Nana's purse. But I was provoked with injustice, right? It made me upset. So there's a righteous anger. What it took me was not a good place. Um, but that is a vulnerability in my heart. And quite often over the years, uh, what I heard in my mind and in my soul is that I was an angry man. And that anger created a gap, as we saw in that picture, between me and God. And it either led me to feel shameful and guilty, or it led me to work real hard. Um, I'm going to serve and give my life away as much as possible so that I can be accepted, not as an overflow of Jesus. And so that anger was really the f at the forefront of my, of my life. Um, but the enemy is right. I do struggle with anger, and that produced a lot of sin in my life. And at times I conducted myself in an angry way, but I was not an angry man. Because that's a character statement the enemy makes against us. And what I have to say to us tonight is that say to us tonight is there is a particular way that God looks at us that is different than the voice of the enemy that accuses our soul. Um, but I want to look at just some, a couple things that I feel like is important for us to see that I saw in this text. And it says, I want to use an, uh, kind of a, a picture, but it says the oldest one who accused this woman left first. And uh, if we use that analogy, I want to look at the oldest lie, the accusations of old against God. Um, it's found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, excuse me, verse 4. And it, uh, it's the woman who God told, do we have it up there, Ivan? Yeah, can we look at that? This is what the serpents respond back to the woman after God gave her the instruction of don't eat of the fruit of the tree of, uh, of knowledge, uh, good and evil, and, uh, or you'll die. And this is his response. You won't die? <laughs> Just start a contrast, right? You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. Do we have the next verse? God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both, both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful, its fruits, fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. That's a whole different teaching, right? But it's interesting, verse 4 and 5, that the enemy said something of old from back, excuse me, the thing of old that the enemy said was God, God's words are not true. His words are not true. He also said God's character and heart is not good. But the Bible teaches us something different. And so in the story of this woman who was about to be stoned, she was, a Bible, she was just caught in the middle of really the enemy's attack against God. And so are we. We're caught in the crossfire a lot. And so if you hear a recurring voice in your heart and your mind tonight that says God's words are not true towards you and that his heart is not good, that is a lie. That is a red flag. I grew up in Southern California and we had a radiation plant next to Huntington Beach and sometimes we'd want to go out and go boogie boarding and we'd get there and you'd think the ocean would look what color? No, no, it looked red. And it wasn't a red tide, it was a different type of red. And that was, there was a, an actual flag that said, please don't go in the water. And uh, there's, uh, if I could uh, tell us tonight that red flag that we can wave, not to go down that rabbit trail of thinking that tells us that God is not good, that his heart is not for us, and that his words are untrue, that is a lie from the pit of hell. That is not true. And that wants to cover you. That wants to, like a blanket that's too short, try to prov provide warmth. But it's just not true. The Bible teaches us something different. It teaches us that God is good and wants to teach us in the way we should go. Psalm 139 says that the Lord has more thoughts of you than the sand on the seashore, that they're pleasant, that he, you are the apple of his eye, the dead center of his focus, and that you are beautiful and wonderfully made, that he rejoices over you, that he celebrates you. This is true. This is true. I want you to receive that tonight, that the way God looks at you is pure. My son, no matter what he does, he could throw a ball at me. He could tell me he hates me when he can form words. He can go and steal, ro rob. I will never, 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 never disown him. I love my son. And I just want to say that to you tonight. That's God's picture to you. That he loves you no matter what you've done. Nothing, nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of Jesus. 
This is so important you understand that because that's the foundation you stand upon. And God wants to offer that to you tonight, that the way he sees you is pure because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And this is the bridge that connects us together. Um, so the lie for me was that I was an angry man, and this is true. I am a sinful man. But thank, thank you, Jesus, for your work on the cross. And you made a, the Bible tells us you made a public dispect, uh, uh, public. Um, thank you, I can't say that word. He took everything that accuses us and nailed it to the cross. And it's final right there. And so tonight, when you get out of your seats and you eat food and you laugh with your friends, let the words that the enemy came against you with be final. Let it be cut off. We're going to have an opportunity to respond to that tonight through prayer. But I want to say that the Lord wants to let you know that you are his sons and his daughters. And with that, there comes blessings. But like the accusations against God, there's accusations that are made specifically against us. Do we have that on the board there, Evan? Now, this list I could have wrote down for days, but I just picked two. Um, two, specifically ones, two specific ones that are close to my heart that I feel like I hear the accuser say. And the first one is that I am condemned before God. You saw that, you, excuse me, you read that in the scripture where he, uh, Jesus looks at the woman and says, um, where, where are those that condemn you? They're not around. And Jesus says, neither do I. Because the result of her decisions for committing adultery was to be condemned. Um, condemned means pronounced guilty. But the Lord had a, a different pronouncement for her. Not that he sideswiped her sin. This is so, so important you hear me say this. God, Jesus didn't say, for the sake of mercy, I'm disregarding your sin. The Bible teaches us that the wages of sin is death. But that's what Jesus did on the cross. And so this is before Jesus died on the cross, but he was teaching her what the, the heart of the Father is. And the heart of the Father is to extend mercy. And he showed that mercy to her when he said, go and sin no more. But the Lord intercedes on our behalf, specifically when we get accused. So for me, the accusation is that I'm condemned, that I'm pronounced guilty before God. The second accusation that I feel like that we get in that scripture is there's no hope or a future. Because what was the overall goal of these people accusing this woman? What do they want to do? They want to pick up stones and do what? They want to kill her. Now, I don't have anyone chasing me, literally trying to kill me. Um, but I do have things that try to kill my heart, try to kill my motivation, kill my joy. The Bible teaches us that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Steal my hope and future. Rob my dreams and passions. And overall, get me to a place where I'm muzzled, and like those pictures, I'm isolated behind those bars. And, but the, for this woman, it was a literal death. The enemy wanted to take something from her. And the accusation against her, she had no hope or a future. And I feel like for, there may be someone here tonight that feel the same way, maybe based upon the decisions you've made, that there is no hope in the future or, or life in God. But I would say something different to you tonight. I would say that the Bible teaches us that God's heart for us is that there is a hope in the future, and it's plans to prosper us. Nine years ago, I shared the story that I was a knucklehead, and I could share stories with you one-on-one -on -one that are not godly, <laughs> that are evil. And sometimes the enemy likes to remind me of that. But I think the Lord in his mercy, I fast forward nine years later, I get to live in the blessing of my wife and my son and my future children. I feel so honored to have the opportunity to share with you all uh, God's word. But that is the hope in the future. That is what God has for you. He has these things for you. This is so important you understand that. Um, amen? Okay. So... How do we receive God's mercy? You know, youth are funny. I'm a youth pastor. I, my, it's great. <laughs> uh, this has nothing to do with what I'm about to say, but just for example, I had a youth one time. Okay, so there's a family in our church who loves habaneros. I love habaneros. I love to eat them. They love the color. I love to eat them. So they gave me the baggie of them, and I was super excited. Uh, super. I was, I was excited. And I had it in the youth room, and, and this is so funny. <laughs> Uh, one of the youth goes, can I have it? And I'm like, no way, man. you gotta, you got to ask your parents. Don't be taking this and eating it. And uh, after service, they like had it, and they were snickering. And I turned, and they, they put the whole habanero in their mouth and pointed at me. And I said, hey, buddy, you're in a world of hurt right now, not me. <laughs> and they ate it, and they just all of a sudden were like, oh! 
and they ran and they went into an intern kitchen, one of the main kitchens in here, bypassed about four people, like saying, hey, hey, stop, stop, and they grabbed a gallon of milk and just started chugging the gallon of milk as it fell all onto the ground, and I thought to myself, oh, look, that's just a glimpse of life with youth. Um, <laughs> but one of our youth, uh, I specifically, I wanted to bless him. I felt, on my heart, I wanted to give him some money, some cash flow for, for some new things, and so uh, they were, believe it or not, a little hesitant on it. Uh, I was like, hey, there's nothing attached. I just want to give you some money. And so can I tell you, I'm not kidding. Literally, the fight I had was trying to open up their fist to put the money in it. And uh, I was like, literally, please take it. It's going to be so much easier if you just open and receive. But I think it's a good picture of what our heart's like at times. And sometimes we choose to keep it clinched. Sometimes life scars us, words that are spoken to us. Maybe that you're a failure, that you fall short. Maybe it's words that you'll never amount to anything. Or no matter how hard you try, it will always be. Uh, those things tend to cause our heart to go like this, to be hardened. And the Bible teaches us that we're able to soften our heart to receive based upon the words we speak to one another. That's Hebrews chapter 3. And so, how do you receive the mercy of the Lord? How do you receive the mercy of the Lord? Well, our starting place is repentance. For me, my repentance was what I was putting my faith in. What I was putting my faith in was the, and trust in was the words that were shaped, that tried to shape me. And some of these things uh, were just spoken to me, like I, I'll never amount to anything. Or I was overweight, so words were, were thrown at me that started to shape my image. But I, some of those words just hurt my heart. Um, but some of them provoked anger, and I liked the safety of the anger. I liked the refuge that it provided in my heart. It was a comfortable place I was familiar with. And there was a lot of comfortable places, regardless of about life or night, life or not, that I went to. And I had to be willing to let go. Um, Blanca, could I have you come up real fast, please? Yeah, Blanca's one of our youth leaders. She's awesome. I'm going to just use this as an illustration. There are things in life that grab my arm, Blanca. Blanca is a black belt, so I just want to let you guys know she could beat me up. But there's things that grab, grab you in life. That's the bondage. That's the things that shape us, that speak words to us, and it holds on to us. And, uh, and it hurts. And we don't always want to receive it, but sometimes we get so familiar with it holding on to us, we hold on back. And we take comfort in it. And the Bible teaches us that there's deliverance, that God comes and he severs the things that want to hold on to us. But if God came and he severed this arm, what's going to happen? Mine's attached. And repentance, repentance is us learning to let go. It's us learning to turn to the Lord. And like this woman, her accusers threw her. Thank you, Blanca. Thank you so much. Her accusers threw her in front of Jesus. But when she was met, when she was in front of Jesus, the accusers faded away. And the Lord then gave her an opportunity to receive the mercy by walking in repentance. And how did she walk in repentance? She walked in faith. She chose to believe that she was forgiven, that she was right before the Lord. She could have got back up, and the Bible doesn't tell us what happened to this woman, but I want to believe that she left in faith. There's so many other times in the Bible where the Lord says, be healed, go in faith, go in faith, go in faith. It says it a lot. Be a good Bible study. Just check how many times he says that. But he always sends us out, go in faith. And uh, this woman left in faith. I believe that with all my heart. So she received mercy by walking in repentance, turning from her sin. And you see Jesus acknowledge this at the end of the scriptures. Can you put that story of John back up, Ivan, the last verse? Jesus said, no one, Lord. Or excuse me, she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now, go from now on, sin no more. Sin no more. It gave her an opportunity to make a new decision. And mercy from the Lord by no means does not address our sin. I am where I am today because the Lord put men in my life and people in my life to address my knuckleheadness, <laughs> my immaturity. But the Bible teaches us that the goal of that instruction is love. And the love of the Lord addresses our sin, but always gives us an opportunity to turn. And um, there was the actual accusers, but there was her actual sin. She was caught in adultery. There was two things happening. Um, the Lord intervened on her behalf to silence the accusing voice. But then he acknowledged her sin by saying, go and sin no more. And 
I'm not saying that there's people, well, we're all human, so I'm sure we're sinning in some way, shape, or form. Um, but I'm, but I, what I'm saying tonight is the partnering with the lies of the enemy can be sin. And what I want to offer us is a new way of thinking, a new shifting from um, places of comfort to what the Lord has to say about us. Because like that youth, I'm trying to get to open his hands, the Lord's trying to get us to open our hearts to believe that we are his sons and daughters and that he loves us. This is so important. And that's the turning to him. And then in faith we walk it out. I want to tell you the promises of God right now in regards to what I just said. Acts 3.19. Do we have these scriptures, Ivan? Okay, Acts 3.19. says this, Repent of your sin and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. And the next verse says, So that times of refreshment may come. Times of refreshment. I'm living in the times of refreshment from the Lord, from turning from my sin. I'm getting to experience it with my family, with you as a church family. And it started with what I was entertaining in my mind. But the Bible teaches us that there is times of refreshment. Okay, so when we receive refreshment, what does it look like? And here's where I feel like the Lord's offering us three things tonight. When we, uh, when we partner with how God views us in faith and we walk in faith, I believe that here's three things that came, came to my mind. Can we go to my one? The Matthew 9. Some people brought to him a paralyzed man on the mat. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, Be encouraged, my child. Your sins are forgiven. When we walk in faith, we experience forgiveness of sins. We experience forgiveness of sins. Matthew 15. says, Dear woman, Jesus said to her, Your faith is great. Your request is granted. And her daughter was instantly healed. Faith brings healing. In physical healing, when I was 19, I, at that time, I made so much knucklehead decisions and lived in fear, I developed an ulcer. And I thought that ulcer that I had was a result of my sin. And so I was a new Christian, and I just thought, this is what I have to live with. This is what, the, this is what God is telling me is the exchange. And I met a pastor man that I've never seen a day in my life since. And he chuckled at me and said, James, he said, you don't, God doesn't want you to live with that. And faith drove me, because he offered prayer in our camp, it was a young adults camp down, down in Los Angeles. And I just felt like, nope, this is what I have to live with. And so the camp ended, and he was leaving. And Faith drove me to run down that hill and meet him as he was getting in his car. And that's when he chuckled. He put his hand on me and prayed that I would be healed. And that week when I went to the doctors, I had no ulcer. It was gone. And the doctor was like, well, oh, trippy. But the Lord healed me. But Faith provoked something. Not that it was within me, but my faith in God, my faith in who God says he is. Uh, is what caused me to go. And faith isn't blindly, I'm about to step, blah, blah, blah. It's not that. Faith is me making decisions based upon the character of God. And God says he's faithful. God says he's faithful. And then thirdly, 1 John. This is one of my favorite scriptures in the whole Bible. It's 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. For every child of God defeats the evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Isn't that awesome? Faith in Jesus causes us to have victory, to overcome the enemy. You heard it through 10 youth last week, how they overcame the things and the voices in their mind and in their heart and their literal, literal physical ailments through their faith in Jesus, and that provoked them to ask for help. And I want to offer us that tonight. For the Bible says in James chapter 2 that mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And the enemy wouldn't want to judge and conclude things about us that would, that would cut and hurt our soul, but the Lord would offer something else to us tonight, that we're his sons and his daughters, and that he loves us. And our part in response to that is shifting our way of thinking, of believing the old and believing the new. And that's what I want to give us an opportunity to do right now. Um, what I would love is, yeah, if you want to play piano, just so it's when I'm sitting in silence, but um, I love to give opportunities to respond. Jesus is in the business of giving us opportunities to respond so that he can reveal his, his character and his heart to us. And so if you guys just close your eyes with me, I first want to give an invitation um, that was given to me 11 years ago that changed my life. And I use this analogy. Uh, I don't know about you, but have you ever had bad food? Have you ever been to a restaurant and just was like, man, that was a horrible meal? I guarantee you do not swear off food. You do not say, I'm done with food, I will never eat again. No, you become malnourished. 
in a lot of ways we've had bad interactions with church in the name of Jesus. We've had bad interactions with God because of other people or things we've heard. And in some of our hearts we've written off God. But what I would say to you tonight is don't write off God. If you've never had the opportunity to receive Jesus, the Lord would offer himself to you tonight. And as the scripture we read, that's how you overcome the evil one, is by receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And the Bible says that if anyone believes in Jesus, he's a new creation. The old will go and the new will come. And the new is that he has hope and a future for you. He has a family to restore, relationships to heal, hearts to heal. And he wants you to know that he loves you so that you may spend eternity with him. This is true. This is true. I promise this. I promise this. And if you tonight would like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, uh, every eye is closed. This is a personal thing. I would love for you just to uh, look up at me and make eye contact. Not because I'm the answer, but because you're doing that for the Lord. Okay, I see you. Thank you. Hey, I would say this. Don't be afraid. Don't fear. For the Lord of the love will cover that fear. I was afraid too. Hmm. Okay. So you, I'm going to pray this prayer. You can pray in your own words, in your own heart, to yourself. But I'm going to pray this and you can partner if you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior right now. Jesus, I ask that you come into my life that you forgive me of my sins, that you be my God, that you be my King. Teach me, Lord, to serve you. Show me how to love you all the days of my life. Lord, I receive you as my, my God in your name. Amen. 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 For those that did that, welcome to the family of God. Amen. Yeah, we get clap. It's a good thing. Yes. <laughs> when that happened to me 11 years ago, I had uh, about four or five older ladies just lay hands on me, and I was just weeping <laughs> because I could feel like a monkey was wrenched off my back. And if you didn't feel that tonight, that's okay too. Something happened in your soul. The Lord has put his Holy Spirit inside of you. But... You don't have to bow your heads, but if you can close your eyes, I would love to speak to another group of people. Those that feel so accused and constantly heckled by the voice of the enemy that says that you're small, that your words don't matter, or maybe there's a group as well that your words used to matter, and you used to have a voice. And the Lord would say, those days have come and gone. You feel like you're, you think that those days have come and gone. Uh, but I say the Lord says something different to you guys tonight. Caleb said, I'm stronger at 80 than I was at 40, 40 in the Bible. But if you feel like you're heckled, and you feel like you're wanting that voice in your mind and in your heart to be silenced tonight, then today's the day. The moment, this is the moment where Jesus heals our heart. And I don't want to know exactly what that is. That's between you and God. But what I would ask, with the eyes are closed, if you lift your hands to the Lord, the same way my son lift his hands to me to be picked up. If you want that voice to be silenced, that's your step of faith right now. I'd love to give you the opportunity to do that. And I'm going to pray that the Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit, would come in right now and start to silence those voices. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And you keep your arms up. I'm going to pray. Thank you, Lord. You are faithful. Lord, you say that you command victories. That is your word, that you are the God of victory. There's nothing greater than you. There's nothing above you. You are in all things and through all things. And by your word, creation came to an existence. And through your blood, we've received forgiveness of sins. So in that authority, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray for healing in the hearts of these people right now. I ask, Lord, that you would come in and that you would drive out the substitute, the voice that wants to offer its, lessons plan, its lesson plan, that wants to assign its homework and its material to this congregation that says that you are small, that your voice doesn't matter, that your past mistakes will dictate your future. We silence the name of uh, the voice of the enemy in the name of Jesus. We silence the accusers that brought that adulterous woman in her sin and said that you don't have a future. And in the name of Jesus, I exchange hope instead of hopelessness. I pray for the exchanging of joy and peace instead of fear and anxiety. 
I specifically want to pray for those who experience nightmares in this room, those that are afraid of the dark and to lay their head on the pillow uh, because of the images that come in their mind. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. I ask for sweet sleep and sweet slumber in the name of Jesus, that they do not anymore have to look over the left or the right about what is to come or worry about what is behind them, but Lord, you would instill a peace into their heart. I thank you, Jesus, that you are the God that heals. So we pray for your healing touch in the name of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. And in the grace we say amen. 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 Um, I would offer this with you guys, that this right here will change your life. I just, it's what changes my life. It's... Um, I'm sometimes I'm too aggressive, I rip pages, I have a friend here that can attest to that, like just ripping through it, but I would say devour this. This is what changed an angry man to a man of joy. This is what changed a man with a frow to the one who sometimes you always say, you're smiling all the time. I don't know why, I'm, I'm smiling because the Holy Spirit put joy in my heart. But I would say to you guys that this right here will change it. Uh, there's 31 Proverbs, one for each day. There's a psalm each day you can read. And if you don't know where to turn to in the Bible, 1 John is an amazing book. 1 John is an amazing book. But let this uh, be the thing that starts to change your life because God will speak to you. Amen? Amen. I love you guys. God bless you. Have a great evening. And uh, if you're new tonight, please make your way to the inner courtyard. If you go through this door and follow around our buildings like a square donut. There's a hole in the middle. Please go to it. You will find food, and it's free. It's on us tonight. See, the pastor, James, told me I can eat food for free. You can eat food for free. If you do come in regularly, you can get it for free. Uh, but let's hang out in the middle. And then there's baptism sign-ups in the inner courtyard, too. Thank you, guys. God bless you.